Hey everyone, this is Nick Pino. I'm with Brian Hoyer. This is Smarter Tech. Brian, thank you so much for taking the time today. Yeah, I'm excited to be here again. I think this is our second interview on your podcast and it's At been least. a while. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long while. I think uh, you were probably part of season one. I think episode 33, if I recall correctly. I, I know that it's a... Uh, uh, it's an episode that I keep sending to people through customer support that say, hey, um, the 5G networks are there. What can I do about it? And I kind of mention, well, you know, a shielded room is one way to do it. And so for, for people that are not familiar with your work, I know my community has grown so much with the MF Hazard Summit. Uh, talk about what you do. What are your credentials? A bit of your background. You have a, a, a background as a nutritionist also. So you're not someone that got into EMFs in the first place. So just maybe uh, just a, a five minute round of uh, your credentials and how you got into this work with Shielded Healing. Sure. Yeah. So in about 2000. 12, I began my work as a nutritional therapy practitioner with functional nutrition. And uh, through that experience, you know, I was living in California at the time and I had a practice of about 50 to 75 full time like clients and uh, and was dealing with a lot of the typical modern illnesses and things that people are dealing with today with autoimmune conditions, uh, leaky gut, lots of uh, adrenal and thyroid uh, problems and having you know quite a bit of success with that uh, in my in my practice uh, but there was there were a few things that I was just this just just kind of really bugged me about um, my work with people and it was that they were surrounded by all this technology all the time and one of my continuing education tracks that I took was I took basically all the trainings with dr. Dietrich Klinghart and in one of his lectures it just really grabbed a hold of like the the soul of me <laughs> and and he said like people will not get better unless they take care of the emf radiation in their yeah. home you know <laughs> that's a and, good impression <laughs> and and I, yeah and i was like oh my gosh this is this is crazy like and he, and he said like p like children with autism like you know half of his practice is children with autism and he's like, they, the parent will not get better unless, you know, or the, the kid will not get better unless the, you know, they, they won't make any recovery unless they actually take care of these things. And he listed all these different things. And I was like, none of my customers or clients are taking care of any of these things. And so I started implementing mm. a lot of those things, the, what I would call the Kling Hardian way. Um, because there's a building biology way and then there's, there's a, there's a higher level Kling Heart way to do things. And now I feel like I've taken what he did and made it, you know, on a more uh, massive scale and also included light and some other things that I, I thought were uh, from a more ancestral perspective. Like, how can we wake up all these dormant healing responses in the body to help people's bodies actually heal? And that was kind of the basic gist of what, what Shielded Healing started as was, was me with me on my own with my nutrition practice. And then I started to do these electromagnetic radiation assessments in people's homes. And I think the first year I started the company, I did like over 500 assessments. So I was, wow. I was, there was one month where I did 35 assessments in like 20 days <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'll never do that again. <laughs> Like, and you have it, what? You have your fifth kid, right? Your fourth or fifth? I, yeah, I have four kids. Yeah. Four kids. And you have yeah. four kids. Yeah. Well, uh, how, so, how is that possible? I mean, well, yeah, at, yeah. yeah, at the time, I, I, was, I think I had two kids and I was just okay. traveling. It was, a, it was a crazy tour when I was going around like Minnesota. Mm. And it was right after I'd done like a speaking engagement for a, um, for a biohacking retreat. But um, yeah, it was... It was insane. And I have all my colleagues, my new functional nutritional therapy practitioner colleagues who were super interested in it because mm. it's it's kind of taking the approach of ancestral nutrition and wellness and applying it to the environment because yeah. a lot of us are kind of in this health space where we're like, okay, it makes sense that humans should eat what our ancestors ate and you know, basically put into our bodies what our ancestors put into their bodies. Yeah. But a lot in the wellness and health and wellness uh, industry, they don't think about, okay, well, we're talking about what we're putting into our bodies, but what are we putting our bodies into? What's the environment mm. that we're putting our bodies into? Yeah. And so it, it kind of flipped things around for me, like, okay, there's kind of two pieces here. There's, there's elements, you know, ancestral elements, things that we can put inside of our body, 
but then it's also the environment, the ancestral environment. What are we putting our bodies into and how is that interacting with, you know, our innate intelligence, the, the d different mechanisms inside of the body and how is it interfering with metabolism and hormones and circadian rhythms and all of these different things. And so um, as I started implementing these solutions for people in my practice, I started seeing leaky gut healed without supplementation or they'd only need like four, like four weeks of, of a leaky gut protocol. And then if they were sleeping in a shielded room or a room that's been mitigated from electromagnetic radiation, then they wouldn't need like continue like every three months another leaky gut protocol because you know and it, it kind of confirmed for me that look there's things in our environment that are causing a lot of these stressors or, or allowing our stress cup to kind of overflow into this state of inflammation and oxidation and so uh, when we start to address these environmental inputs whether it's emf or mold or Lime or, or these other talk like environmental toxins, you know, like chemicals, the air quality, um, pesticides and herbicides that are sprayed on the ground, like all of these things in the environment are impacting. And the thing with EMF is it's impacting in such a way that it's attacking your blood brain barrier and also your gut membrane and your eyes. And then if you're pregnant, it's protect, it's, it's actually attacking the, that placental barrier as well. So the barriers are so important for all the environmental toxins to the, those barriers have to be intact. Otherwise yeah. you're much, much more vulnerable to all the toxicities in the environment. And so that's why EMF really comes as like a lot of people are talk about, okay, well, we got to get you out of the moldy environment. And I agree with that. We got to get you out of, out of, uh, you know, this situation where your neighbor's spraying glyphosate and R Roundup, on, on the on the border of, of your property and it's coming over on to, onto you. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, I agree with all of that, but also the EMF, if you protect your barriers, you're going to be protected against a lot of these other things as well, um, much, much more robustly. And so it's not this or that. It's yes, we have to do this and we have to do that. But um, a lot of people that are electrosensitive that actually have severe symptoms from... Uh, exposure to electromagnetic radiation they say they can feel it they've got pain in their head they've got pain in their joints and their you know just in overall fatigue and brain fog all sorts of symptoms that you can have uh, they 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 have all of this inflammation and and they don't there a lot of a lot of these these individuals because we work with a lot of them now they aren't thinking about what they can do to more robustly take care of their body and the and oh, these okay. barriers they're thinking more about it in terms of just avoiding the electromagnetic stress, which is important. And we do that. That's why we have shielded, you know, the name of my company is Shielded Healing. We believe in shielding and getting away from this, uh, the, th this toxic environment. But you also have to think about how you're going to shield on the inside out. I agree. And, yeah. and so, you know, the whole ancestral lifestyle, I mean, we've just kind of been plucked from human history like our, our biology and put into this futuristic environment where it's not the same as what our ancestors lived in. And so our bodies are in this alien environment and we're trying to, you know, they're, it's trying to figure out, okay, how do I interact with this pulsing radio frequency or this 60 hertz electricity from the wall? And it, it's a stress response in the body. And so your body doesn't, is not going to get used to this at least in your lifetime. So we have to figure out how to recreate a more ancestral environment in the home. And that's what we do when we go around to people's homes. We're testing for six different stressors uh, on the electromagnetic spectrum. It includes artificial light. So light that's, that's uh, in the wrong spectrum. It's the wrong intensity. And, and, it's, uh, and it may like, be oscillating or flickering at a certain rate that's not natural. And that all has a huge biological effect. And then, uh, and then we're talking about wireless radiation, which is the big, the big one that everyone's talking about. 5G, all of that, Wi-Fi. And then electricity from the wiring in your walls, uh, magnetic field issues, from, a lot from wiring errors, but also motors and things that are running. Uh, we're, we're testing for that. And then dirty electricity, there's all these thousands of frequencies that are, that are riding on your electrical system that are created from from different devices and in, in, in appliances in the, in the neighborhood that are connected to the grid. 
And then uh, geopathic stress. This is stress that comes up from the earth. The, the traditional geobiologists, they have tested for this uh, for probably 150 years now. And then there's a lot of ancient traditions. The Chinese had feng shui, the Indian culture. Uh, over in, uh, in the east, they had the Vastu tradition. And even Native Americans, they had their own tradition of different types of energies on the earth and and uh, you know how that, that's why a lot of them were very upset when when Americans started uh, putting these huge buildings with these metal rods in the ground. It was disturbing the natural energy of the land and, and things mm. like that. So all of those things can impact a house. And what we want to do is we want to go in and mitigate and change things, and then also where needed, we have to do some shielding usually. And so, you know, there, there's some homes where we might be going in and uh, and we don't know what to expect, but, you know, there's smart homes that we that we go in and we have to track down like probably a hundred different signals <laughs> and turn them <laughs> off one at a time and, yeah. and figure out what's, what's going on. Some places, uh, there's so much interference from the cell phone towers that we have to first shield the, the room and, and rule out a lot of the other issues, the magnetic fields, the dirty electricity and, and all these other things that, uh, that we have to do that before we go and fine tune on, on the retest, which we mm. include in the original assessment fee that we, that we charge people. But it's, gotcha. a, it's a process, you know, so people sign up with us, we, we go into their home, we, we assess the situation, we make recommendations, and then we come back for a free retest and, uh, and then implement fine-tuning recommendations after, afterwards. But, you know, the big thing that I want people to get from our services is that um, you use our services once and, and for that home, you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to purchase like another assessment or anything like that. It's just, you know, what we assess that day you're going to have the support you need to to get the solutions put in place. And I don't I don't want people to sit there worrying about EMF for the rest of their life just because we came to your house once. I want to provide you with the solutions and then uh and then you basically have have support through that and then you don't have to think about it anymore because you've taken care of it. Yeah. And that's so important. Uh and especially I I, I know that uh, that's something we, we did talk about. What what differentiates your company from some people in the field? Uh, I know there are tremendous people in the field, and there are it's a, it's also an emerging field where you have certain people that take certifications and kind of leave their clients a little bit hanging with wondering what to do after an assessment or things like that. So I've I've heard mixed results from uh, EMF surveys, to be quite honest. Like some people get them and they're very happy. Some other people say, well, <laughs> I don't know, this consultant came to my home, said, uh, oh, your home is very dirty and then left. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and then I'm left like, oh my God, uh, my family is in danger. So what I like about your approach and what I've seen uh, hearing from our course members and whatnot is that you actually provide, okay, look, here's the list of solutions, depends on your budget, and we're going to implement those as, as, as your budget allows, right? As your family <laughs> relationships allows also, because it can be a big deal investing a few thousand dollars in a shielded room or uh, even turning off Wi-Fi at night, as we, as we say in our course, Electro Pollution Fix, like, it can be a big deal. It can be like, oh, what? no, 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 don't touch my Wi-Fi, right? So yeah. uh, it's all a process. <laughs> and that, 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 that's really what I like from, from your approach. And so you're not alone with Shielded Healing. Uh, I know when you started, you were probably, did you start a company? You were just the one consultant in it? I was the first, yeah, I was the one consultant when I, when I started and I did everything, my own scheduling, all the, all these things. And now I have five full-time people that travel all around the country. Plus my assistant who basically helps me manage the company, Diane DeStefano. And she's amazing. She's, uh, she started a smart meter group, like, you know, six or seven years ago in Pennsylvania and, and, uh, and is helping people in Pennsylvania like opt out and and get out of the smart meters and stuff like that, but um, yeah, the the team I've developed, uh, you kind of re- what I realized when when I first was doing this uh, when I when I was really before I decided that I needed to f- fill a void in in the industry was uh, 
you know, I, I realized that, you know, I had, I had referred out to several professionals when I was living in California and, uh, and they, the results that came back or the recommendations that came back were, were like, you know, right here. And I wanted them to be up here. And, yeah. and what I mean by that is that, you know, it was like, oh, this isn't the worst I've seen, but you know, I'm not, I'm not concerned about, you know, from a practitioner standpoint, I'm like, I want it to be pristine. You know, I want, I want this environment to be a healing environment. I don't want it to just be average, not the worst somebody's seen. Because if EMFs are really damaging, then they're going to be damaging on 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 this on this level where it's not acceptable to me as a practitioner. And you know, it's like it's like someone turns in a food journal to you and be like, oh, you know, like as a as a nutritionist or something, <laughs> and they're like, oh, I only eat donuts like like twice a day. You know, it's and not this, the worst this I've person, seen. <laughs> This person eats them 10 times a day, like, like they have 10 donuts and, and you only have two. So it's not the worst I've seen. Yeah. You know, it's like, it doesn't it, work. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. You have to, you have to get the environment right. You have to get the diet right. You have to get in a routine with people where they understand that, uh, their lifestyle has to change somewhat. And then there's this dance too. You have to be good socially with somebody. You have to be able to connect with the people where you're going to do the assessment in their home. Um, cause there's people that are skeptical and, you know, you have to be able to get those people on board with, with the solutions. And usually to do that, we have to get them involved in, in being a part of the solution while you're there. If you can't do that and someone's just locked in their office and they don't want to talk to the person that, that, that's a lot harder. We've had situations like that, but, um, but usually, uh, when you have a skeptic, who's an open skeptic in the house. I've trained my team to deal with these situations in such a way where we get them involved, we help them to use the tools and make discoveries for themselves. And, you know, I pride, you know, like Shielded Healing on, on the fact that we've never left a skeptic behind, you know, to date. And if I if we ever do, it's just because the, you know, it's because there was zero interaction with that person. Yeah. If if we have an interaction, I'll, I'll have to rephrase that. If we have an interaction with, with the person and are able to talk to them and be with them on the assessment, we've never left a skeptic behind. Gotcha. You know? Yeah, and that's so, very important. And I know it's a concern for a lot of people that take our course and probably a lot of people that listen to my stuff and read the newsletter. And I, I don't know what the, what's the percentage. I should sh survey people, but I bet there's a large percentage of people who... I've read my book years ago and took the course and bought everything and did nothing. I mean, I, I do mm -hmm. that sometimes with like, I did that with many meditation courses. I just started this year doing a little bit more guided meditation, but for years I bought stuff. It just sat on a website or a hard drive. So I guess some people kind of are, aren't implementing that stuff. And I think part of the reason is sometimes they feel, oh, it's going to create conflict with my teenagers or with my husband or wife. And oh i don't know i'll just i'll just have them take supplements instead like it's a little bit easier you know than taking yeah. wi-fi away anyway yeah the, um i want to switch to something um you, you always have such incredible stories of assessments i know you've done hundreds or more more than a thousand yourself and then you have all these shielded healing professionals that are full-time now do you have uh something that happened in the last month that was let's say an unusual finding or uh, do you see uh, something that changed recently, a trend or certain EMF emitting devices that are so common or something that surprised you in the scope of your work in the last months? Oh man, there's, there's so many stories. It's kind of hard to, to pick, um, which anything that comes to mind. Yeah. Which one, <laughs> but um, the, the one, the one that I like to like to tell that's just really bizarre was, uh, and I think I may have told this before. I don't know if I mentioned it on our last interview, but there was this woman who put in a a, a shielding canopy of ours in her bedroom, and uh, she started having this this reaction to it. That I, from a practitioner standpoint, I knew it was like a very good healing reaction. She had mold like basically emitting from her pores, coming out of her body. Wow. as a reaction to having a shielded space. And she freaked out, returned the canopy, thought it was bad. And I'm like, you know, the question came to my mind, like, is it bad to have mold leaving your body? <laughs> you know? Oh, my God. Is it, you know, or is it good? 
And, you know, it's a question that in the moment you're not thinking about, you think that it's, it's causing some kind of toxic reaction or something, but that's that black stuff that was coming out of your, your pores was, was actually a, a good thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know, there, there's some reactions that people have and really the, the reactions that people have to being in a shielded space, it's, it's really only about maybe one in 200 people have a have a like uh what i would consider to be a herxheimer reaction a healing reaction or a yep. detox reaction and in those situations you know for those people there are some supplements that you can add in to help bind to some of those toxins and escort them out of the body in the proper way in the proper pathway yeah um but as far as like uh common things that we've seen recently actually i have my own personal experience uh We've been waiting on our washer and dryer for a year. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> we moved up to Idaho and, uh, and we'd been waiting on our washer and dryer for a year. Like l- literally like since last June, it's almost June now. So I guess it was 11 months technically, but they just came today and finally delivered uh, the washer and dryer. Now on, on most dryers, and this was the case for the substitute one that they had us gave it to us for for being a loner and everything they they have four wires on the on the dryer and uh because you have the the um the red wire 120 volts the black wire another 120 volts the neutral wire and then the ground wire and so like the the dryers have have those big huge plugs that you plug in and it's got the four prongs it's like you just stick it into the wall and uh on on most dryers that you get, you if you open up the back of them, it has the ground actually connected to the neutral in there. And that's a ground to neutral connection. Technically, from the National Electric Code, that should not happen in a house. That's a National Electric Code violation. But the reason that they do that is because um, some houses don't have the ground wire. And so they need to have a way to ground the, the metal on the dryer and so they ground it through the neutral. Mm. Um, and But the problem with that when you have an actual ground wire coming out is that it creates that ground to neutral connection. And there's that creates a secondary return path for, the, for that current to flow back to the panel. And it'll go through the whole grounding system if it needs to. And so um, I was testing at my panel. And I don't recommend that people do this. You need to have an electrician do this. Um, but I was testing the current on the ground wire, and every time that I turned that circuit on for the dryer, there was neutral current leaking onto the ground wire of, of the house. Mm. And as soon as I unplugged the dryer, it stopped. So I had to open up the back, and I had to unconnect the, the neutral and make sure that the, the um, housing, the metal part, was, was connected to the ground. But that's, a, that's something that I, I believe is on most dryers, and it can cause magnetic field issues uh, wherever that wire is going uh, from your dryer to the circuit panel. That's, and, uh, ah, that's maddening. I mean, from, from you telling me this, like, okay, now dryers are dirty, and just hearing from uh, Alice Dear Phillips from Powerwatch UK or other engineers that talk about the, the electronics that create dirty electricity when you just plug them into a wall. I know you, you talked about a flashlight that was connected once, or maybe that was some, I, I think yeah. other mitigation specialists talked about the flashlight charger that's plugged into a wall, creating that dirty electricity in the entire home. And you, I just tell myself, my God, it's so, I don't know, it's just maddening that like the cheap electronics and how things are built these days creates so many health issues or so much like unnecessary EMF exposure. So it's just, that's just my comment, I guess. I mean, I'm not an expert enough to kind of open my dryer. My wife would look at me like, Nick, do you really know what you're doing? I'm (laughs) the kind of guy that's like not really handy. So, you know, I would open it and then screw up something and then say, oh, I don't know how to put it back together or something like that. So usually I I don't bother with it. But, you know, when you have the capability to test it like you, you probably find a lot of nonsense in these electronics and just why do they do things like that way? And sometimes it's just, oh, well, uh, we kind of save the a dollar on production costs. Well, that, yeah, it's that. And then also just the way that houses are designed. I was at a recent house in, in Florida that they had this 
the panel it was like a really large home and the 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 electricity for the entire property was right on this back side of this kitchen wall and it was causing magnetic fields to go into like half the kitchen and so the only way to to mitigate that is to take apart that wall in the kitchen that has cabinets and tile and and everything on it and the fridge is on that wall too and put some magnetic shielding yeah in in there um, most of the time with with magnetics, when you're when you're assess, you know, we do home build consultations as well, and commercial consultations for a lot of doctors' clinics and, and offices and things like that. But uh, you can, if you build it correctly from the right from the start, uh, you can get those those uh, you know circuit panels and appliances in the in good locations where they're not going to be affecting your living space. Yeah, and that's yeah. one of the main things that we we are helping people with. And also the 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 wires where they go, um, in in the structure of the home when you're when you're planning. Those are those are the main things that we're helping people with with the with the build, uh, consultations as well as um, you know talking about lifestyle habits. Like, okay, do you really want a fully shielded house, or do you want to have some places where you need some connectivity because yeah. of this other person in your household? And helping plan shielded spaces versus non-shielded spaces mm, yeah. and what's going to actually reduce your exposure because if someone's trying to use their cell phone in a shielded space it could actually increase your exposure um if if you have someone in the family who's always trying to connect yeah um, when they don't have good signal because when your phone doesn't have good signal it ramps up and it gets higher and that was actually one of the things i wanted to show you i like doing demonstrations um Sure, with, go ahead. with phones and everything is, uh, you know, it's something with the cell phone that a lot of people don't talk about is, you know, okay, my phone's on airplane mode right now. You can see, see that yep. there. Yeah. And, uh, what, what, what phone is this? So we have the right context. Yeah, this is a, what is it? iPhone, uh, 12 pro iPhone 12. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, oh, everyone's talk. you know, with cell phones, you're worried about the wireless radiation yes. mostly, right? But what a lot of people don't realize is that it also produces a magnetic field. So yeah. when I, here, I'll just put it up, up this. If I go on here and I just start clicking around, I'll take it off the airplane mode. You can hear it start to start to go up. We hear it a little bit, yeah. I'll do it by the microphone. What's the meter you're using and what is that measuring? This is measuring magnetic fields. Gotcha. It's the NFA okay. 400. And so if I if I go on here and let's see, I'll go to watch. Now what's interesting is if I put the speaker on, you get more magnetic yeah. field when the speaker's on. So a lot of people, you know, are, are using these phones. And even when you have this wired to an Ethernet cable, which is what I do usually when I'm, when I'm uh, using this. Yeah. Um, there's a little adapter, an Ethernet adapter that you can hook up right here to the lightning connector. You can do it on Android phones too. And then you can be connected and you can scroll through and, and see everything. But some people, even when they're doing that, you don't have the wireless radiation emitting. But... If you're watching videos and stuff, especially, you've got this magnetic pulsation that's coming right onto your hand that whole time while you're holding it. And uh, and so if you can use headphones in addition to wiring it, that's ideal. But you can also just set it down and and use it, and that's going to be better as far as magnetic field exposure. So Yeah, that makes sense. You don't want to leave it, uh, I don't know, you're watching something on your Ethernet cable, but you leave it on your on your crotch or some like some people would do that or on their stomach almost like yeah you know it's a bad habit yeah, yeah. having it too close to your body i agree yeah i always even if you have a shielded protector too um that magnetic field will go right through it through most of them i think yeah. there might be some out there that actually incorporate some magnetic shielding and and that's helpful i think shield your body has one that that uh, i think so actually blocks the magnetic field too so that's a lot better but even that, there's another thing that that you have a problem with. If you carry cell phones on your body, and Nick, I don't think you're aware of this one. So, oh, what's that? What's that? So, like, uh, 
the phones actually produce dirty electricity too. It's and not surprising. You, yeah, and you can but... measure that in the in the air. So this is a little um, long wave radio, and what's cool about this model is that it has this dB um, okay. sensor in yep. it, and so if I so, uh, Brian, just for context, dB is uh, decibels. It's a measure of the intensity um, yep. of the signal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when I get close to this here, I'm going to turn the volume up on this. So it's at 170 kilohertz is the frequency I'm tuned into. And uh, basically when I get close, you can see the, the reading go go up. I can't really show it on the camera very well, but it goes up to like five or six thousand dB, and then when I go away, it's like at twenty two hundred. Twenty two hundred. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it's it 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 happens at multiple frequencies. You can go through like one seventy up all the way up to the AM radio waves at like seventeen hundred kilohertz, and you know it's just really splotchy between there but basically what what people need to know is that even if your phone is on airplane mode there's still this dirty energy that's created about three or four inches out of your phone so it's still ideal not to carry your phone and it'll blast right through even magnetic shielding at those really low frequencies so that's what a lot of the electrosensitive people are um, dealing with is mm things that appear to be immeasurable with the normal equipment that a building biologist or somebody might come to your house and measure these things with. And so a lot of people that are electrosensitive will actually use styluses to touch phones and things like that and also have yeah. them wired, wired up. And uh, I believe that the reason they feel like they need to do that or they've kind of navigated towards that, it's not because they're crazy, which a lot of traditional medical doctors might might say that it's some, uh, you know, it's all in their head. Uh, you know, they, they, they point to like popular pop culture examples like Better Call Saul and the guy in there that's, that's electrosensitive and it's kind, of, it's kind of all in his head. Yeah. Well, when I, when I go to people's houses, I'm the one that's learning from them if they're electrosensitive. They, their body is like the most sensitive meter that I, you know, by far from any of the equipment that I bring and I bring like twenty to thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment to someone's house when we when we test, and you know, and I'm listening to them and their story and what what they're um, you know what 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 they're sensitive to, and curious. And that was really where we you know with shielded healing we kind of went above and beyond. Is is uh, most people are coming to your house only testing for four things, and we're testing for for six or seven things now, and. And, uh, you know, we want to rule out all of these things that we're finding are actually impacting the body in, in negative ways and really focusing on prioritizing the space so that you can um, sleep better. Sleep's number one. And then places where you're spending a lot of time and then uh, making sure that things that are really close to you are not um, impacting you as well. Yeah, that's that's so important. And uh, your comment you made on electrosensitive individuals I have some scientists like Professor Trevor Mar Marshall, who's at uh, in California, uh, have have measured or tried to quantify the degree of sensitivity of the human body to EMFs, and he, he claims that. According to him, uh, it's orders and orders of magnitude below the most sensitive meter available is basically the human threshold of sensitivity because he found electrosensitive individuals that could literally say, oh no, that's, yes, there's there's a signal, but it could not be detected by the equipment. And I guess through, through different uh, different trial and error, they were able to, to determine that uh, the very, very, very low signals could be detected by these individuals. I don't know how they did it because obviously the, the equipment couldn't pick it up, but uh, or maybe they did in, in certain uh, labs, for example, that are even more sensitive than the meters. That's, that's probably something like that. But anyhow, it just shows you that uh, not to be... I guess one one downside could be being paranoid about it. Like every time I feel bad, it's EMFs and kind of being uh, always blaming EMFs. But that being said, if you feel sensitive, you have to trust yourself also. Like, right. well, that phone, you know, it's technically 
even I, I always talk, okay, put it on airplane mode, put it on airplane mode, and I guess I guess that's not the complete information that I want to convey. It's cool, it's it's snappy, it's quick, and there there are benefits to that, like sleeping better. But if you if your phone is still there right next to your head, it's still open. The electricity is still there. The magnetic field might might still be there. Even some sensors. You showed me the 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 uh, the other time that oh, yeah. uh, these phones uh, have a sensor, a proximity sensor for when it's close to the body and it shoots invisible light all the time, pulsating invisible uh, frequencies in the yep. uh, infrared spectrum, I think, invisible infrared. So, I mean, there's so many things that we don't think about. So if you feel like, no, this machine is making me tingly or there's something wrong with this phone, you know, well, trust that instinct because yes, there are different frequencies and you might be picking up things that even with the equipment, you won't be able to pick up and it's not, it's not all in your head. So trusting your gut, your instinct, your heart on this is, is kind of important. But in the end, the message will be very simple. Get away from the phone, to be honest, especially yeah. if you're that sensitive. Yeah. Well, I would argue, why do you have, do you have a cell phone uh, or barely use it right in like, case of extreme emergency but don't keep a phone if you feel you're extremely sensitive your body needs a break from these things more yeah. than the average person like i can yep. get away with some but likely if you're that sensitive it's likely that yeah you should really stop that do you see do you see a difficulty for people with uh sensitivities to uh let let get away from technology is is that a common problem it, it's a common problem uh, just because of the age we live in, but yeah. they've a lot of them have a, a lot of people that are really sensitive have adapted. Now we're speaking about maybe like twenty percent of my customers. Most of my customers and people that come to us are people in the health and wellness space, biohackers, uh, people that just want to optimize their their health or prevent yep. you know things from happening, protect their family, that sort of thing. Now, um, they, you know, but the people that are sensitive have developed habits out of necessity. What I want to teach people is, is even healthy people or who don't feel this and feel any symptoms from EMF exposure is that, you know, just because you feel it doesn't mean that it's not impacting you. It can impact you in very subtle ways. Eye yeah. twitching. It can impact you as, as like not having as good a sleep, uh, not as good of energy, brain fog. There's, there's different symptoms that it could be impacting where if you just changed your habits a little bit as a precautionary uh, you know, solution for you that you could have better health and wellness because of it. Yeah. And so understanding that the phone just on airplane mode, it's still producing something that might prevent some mom that's watching this from turning it on airplane mode and then putting it in her bra still. Like, oh, it's, yeah. on, it's in airplane mode. Well, if it's in your bra and it's still on airplane mode, which a lot of people do out of airplane mode, but, you know, the, and they've, they have like a lot of studies and anecdotal evidence about women who carry their cell phone in their bra getting breast cancer. The question is, is that from the RF signal? And if they were in airplane mode, would that have protected them? Yeah. Or is it more because right. of the magnetic field and the dirty electricity that's right there all the time as well? Yeah. In addition to the RF pulse. So, you know, there's things that we assume in a lot of studies that, oh, yeah, just turn it on airplane mode and then we can stick it back in our in our bras or in your jock strap if you're a guy. <laughs> like, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, like yeah, uh, that's you know, true. in your pocket isn't better, right? Uh, no, yeah, it's yeah. really close to yeah. to the, you know, those organs. So, yeah, it's it's super important to to think outside of the box when it comes to this uh, and that the cell phone is not just wireless. There's also other electronic components that we can measure and detect with, you know, equipment and, and uh, like, how do we change our habits to more, to be more conducive to what our ancestors would have been exposed to? Yeah. And they, they would not have a cell phone on airplane mode next to the, the, the bed stand. They would have nothing, a rock, a stick, you know, natural, yeah. natural things, yeah. certainly not this, incredible piece i must say of technology that can do like a thousand different things but they wouldn't have that during the night and they wouldn't be spending all their time looking at the screen for example yeah, and, a, so and just, the light and also the light emitting same from thing. the screen yeah, yeah. The so light frequencies. I, and i will say like i i'm not a proponent of saying like you know don't keep this in your bedroom you know like i i i often would if i'm when i'm traveling i'll have this 
next to my bed on a charger on a on a block that's you know a battery block like a yep. like a power bank and i'll charge it so that it's running off a of dc and i have it on airplane mode away from the bed and as long as it's about a foot away mm-hmm. and it's on airplane mode from what i have tested it's not going to be impacting my sleep now um because you know I, I I know that about three or four inches I haven't been able to detect the magnetic field or the or the dirty electricity coming from the cell phone. Um, but someone who's more sensitive, they might have a different experience and they might be able to detect that dirty electricity from further away, you know so or feel the effects of it from further away. So um, it's just these little habit changes that that need to happen for for people. Um, airplane mode's a great recommendation. Um, Wi-Fi off at night is another awesome recommendation that you can do right away. And then, uh, and then there's other things like with, uh, with artificial light that a lot of people can start to get in better habits. There's so many free things that you can do, uh, that help you. Like my, you know, I'll use my mother-in-law as an example as that, uh, you know, she's been having problems with her eyes and, uh, and, you know, one of the one of the typical symptoms of adrenal fatigue is sensitivity at night to light. Mm. And so like a lot of people there, you might be, you might drive at night and the headlights really bother you from the oncoming traffic. I mean, it kind of bothers me too, but some people they're like, I can't stand it. I, I can't, I just can't drive at night. I'm not going to do it anymore. And they have a hard time seeing at night as well. And so like, um, you know, one of the solutions for that is to get more natural light into your eyes. But the catch-22 for someone that has this kind of light sensitivity is they go out in the bright sunlight and they feel like putting on sunglasses, which <laughs> yeah. which blocks all of that awesome natural light that's going to actually help to, you know, those wavelengths are actually going to help to heal your eyes and get your eyes to be healthier. And so you, you need to, you know, you need to be, uh, bring in more natural frequencies from the earth, from the sun, and start cutting out more of the unnatural frequencies from the indoor environment and you know that's from the electrical you know from from the wireless uh, exposures that you have and when you do that and you're able to cut it out at least while you're sleeping that's when those dormant healing responses start to like percolate and they wake up and then your brain's able to to detox better uh, melatonin's able to do its work better in in the entire body at night while you're sleeping and with light, we found that it's particularly important to get that near infrared exposure from the sun outside or from incandescent halogen light bulbs inside, because there's this new study that that came out um, about two years ago that talks about near infrared light, how it actually stimulates the mitochondria not only to produce ATP energy with the photobiomodulation effect and cytochrome C oxidase, but it also helps your, uh, uh, stimulates the production of subcellular melatonin in the body, mm. which 95% of your body's melatonin is on the subcellular level. Only 5% is produced in your pineal gland, according to this study. So, <laughs> so, so our, melat- entire, our understanding, what I've been talking about for years is wrong. I'm not surprised though. It, it always evolves, right? We have these findings and I'm like, oh, okay, well, everything I told you is wrong. Well, I mean, it just evolves, right? Yeah, well, Jeez. and that's, it's, it's just, it changes the basic understanding of what melatonin does in the body. Like, yeah. is it, it's not primarily a sleep hormone. It's primarily a cooling agent on the mitochondrial level for the cell. So the mitochondria is the energy of the cell, produces ATP and, and heat, Right. But it also produces a cooling agent, melatonin, to cool down the cell and act as a as a uh, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant molecule. And melatonin is, you know, you know, per gram, has more antioxidant power than glutathione, mm. and so like much more powerful as a potent, um, you know, free radical scavenger, and uh, and super important for for whole body cellular detoxification. And so, you know, I, I've got something. Is it all right if I share my screen here? Sure. Yeah, yeah, you should be able. Let me double check. Yeah, yeah, yeah go yeah, ahead. I've got please. it. So, um, so this is posted on my Instagram page um, with Shielded Healing. 
And it talks about the near infrared human exposure, you know, the decreasing. And this is from one of the studies that I was talking about. Basically, like in the 1800s, we had this much, you know, you can see how much near infrared. Yeah. NIR is near infrared. So 40% of the sun's energy of light is in the near infrared spectrum. And then this is the visible light. We actually had a lot more visible light exposure too. And then we started kind of moving indoors and got plain glass window. So um, and incandescent light bulbs, they actually have a lot of near infrared. So, but you can still see the reduction just from doing a more indoor lifestyle mm -hmm. and filtering out through the glass. Now the glass stayed about the same here as far as visible light and the near, and then we started transitioning in the nineties over to fluorescent and you know still had some incandescent and then like present day we have all these low e-glass windows which actually block wireless radiation pretty well when they're double or triple coated but they also block the near infrared from coming into your house mm. and then we're switching over to leds and still cfls and getting rid of you know the, there's a new ban that the um, current administration has put into effect that's supposed to take effect in 2023 to completely phase out incandescent bulbs that are above 40 watts. And if that takes effect, I mean, think about how much of that subcellular melatonin is actually going to be produced by most people. There's going to be yeah, almost, almost nothing. Such bad policies. Horrible. And it's, it's thinking about it in terms of energy savings, but we're going to have so many more uh, health problems from the mitochondrial level on up because of because of this reduction in near infrared exposure because if people are spending most of their time indoors which they are more now than ever um, and then they don't have the near infrared exposure while they're indoors all day long while they're while they're working um, I mean you're not producing your body's number one antioxidant the entire day <laughs> yeah and and that's super important that's why like around here I've got you know I've got two lights in here. The sauna space photon light. I've got another mm. one right back here. I actually have the photon light uh, with the 250 watt uh, heat lamp in there. And then I've also got a, another little LED UV light that's kind of shining here. I'm trying to recreate the whole light environment that I'd normally have outside when I'm here indoors so that I can continually have energy through the day. And it's basically like I'm outside. When I have to be inside, I want to recreate the light environment from outside so that I, I am producing enough uh, subcellular melatonin to take care of any of the oxidative stress that I'm getting from a lot of the EMF that I'm exposed to during the day and, and other inputs that are causing inflammation in the body. And so we, we really need to, you know, one of the major things that you can do if you're dealing with an inflammatory condition is get that near infrared halogen incandescent lights in the areas where you're spending the most time throughout the day so that this situation doesn't end up being you where you're like this we can at least get it to around like this in our in our homes and the visible light is also very important especially in the morning to get that signaling of when, when to produce um melatonin later because if you are if you are exposed to visible blue light in the morning you start to build the precursor to melatonin uh, in the pineal gland later in the day and so there, there's this dance that's going on with light that has to do with our ancestral light exposure and our biology and this interaction between our bodies and and the planet and the sun and and our whole system that we've kind of cut things off. We've put a, a barrier in between us and nature and it's, it's causing us to have, uh, you know, causing, uh, you know, biological things to happen and they're detrimental biological things that are happening. So, you know, how do you recreate that? Well, that's kind of, that's, that's what we help guide people through. That's tremendous. You have such a, a deep understanding of, uh, like the, the artificial stuff, but also the natural stuff. And that's really why I've been really resonating with your work and your understanding is that it's not just about avoiding EMFs, avoiding EMFs, avoiding EMFs. Yes, but what else can we gather from nature still? Go outside. <laughs> not No yeah. windows, no glasses, certainly not the blue blockers if you go outside, guys. No, no glasses, no contacts, no sunglasses. And you get the the signaling from nature, including if you have 
a cloudy day like today in Montreal. Don't worry about that because yes, it's filtered, but you're still exposed. Even your skin is picking it up. Your eyes are, are uh, picking it up too. So that's very important. Hey, Brian, before we close out, uh, it has been very fascinating. I want to talk about another frequency of EMFs that a lot of people fear. They talk about those 5G, fifth generation millimeter waves. So that's depending on who you ask, starting at 30 gigahertz, but even even uh, some of 5G that is being used in some downtown areas, or I don't know exactly where it is being used because no one wants it, but let's say it's being used a little bit and some of it is above that 10 gigahertz that most meters end at. So technically it's almost undetectable to the lay person. You told me about the new meter that's coming up. Um, well, do tell us about it. It, it. Will it be affordable? What can it detect? The ranges? And a lot of people have been asking me this in the last three years, to be honest. Sure, yeah. So I was uh, approached by a company in Europe. I'm not sure which country. I think it might be France. Um, but uh, they, they are in development of this 5G meter. It should be out by the time this podcast comes out. Uh, supposed to be out June of 2022. Um, and I was sent a prototype about four months ago. And this is it. But um, it detects millimeter waves. And I'll show you. I have to connect the battery. And they don't have an on switch in this this uh, prototype. But they'll have it by the time that it's it comes out. Um, oh, shoot. You know what? It just I just soldered this on and it just broke off the wire. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's almost as if the someone doesn't want yeah. us to show to show it. But anyway, it works. What does it detect? Yeah. What's the range that it could detect? Well, it can de it detects between um, 20, 26 and uh, let's see. There there's a there's a main uh, Verizon's five G ultra wideband is is what it will detect um, mainly. I'm gonna share my screen here so you can see this because I do have a um, sure. Can you see that? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. So this is on my Instagram page. I actually took the meter out to Spokane and was measuring 5G there. And so um, th this is these are all the specs right here. Uh, it doesn't test in 39 gigahertz yet, but they have it so that you'll you'll be able to upgrade it later to de to detect that. Um, but basically, you can get it like on the basic form. It goes from 40 megahertz to 10 gigahertz and has a setting for that. And then if you get it with the millimeter wave detection, the total for the meters around a thousand dollars, and that detects between twenty six and thirty gigahertz, yeah. plus the base model testing from forty to ten gigahertz. But you can you have to test those things separately. Okay. Um, but you know there's the other millimeter waves. Like I I purchased one a few years ago and then ended up returning it. Uh, thank thank goodness. <laughs> But it was it was like eight thousand dollars, you know, yeah. and and I tested and I, I you know at the time there wasn't uh you know they were just rolling out five G and I wasn't detecting much and it was kind of uh, frustrating. I was like I spent eight thousand dollars on something that I'm not detecting much of, but now it kind of makes sense to to do it. So um, they've tried to make this as affordable as possible and the upgraded antennas you'll be able to send in for for those as as that as they become available, but. Yeah, five hundred dollars for the base unit up to ten gigahertz, which most of the five G frequencies are actually below ten gigahertz. The only five G frequencies that are above that are the ultra wide band, which I have this video testing them. And what's interesting is that most of this is actually coming from the five G phones when you're when you're using it. So if you actually just go to my Instagram page, you'll see this video posted there. And you can, uh, you know, you can, you can look at that. I'll, and, I'll include uh, it in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, most of the ultra wideband is actually emitting from the phone itself. And so like in this video, you can actually see, you know, there's a tower right across the street by that McDonald's right there. And uh, that's, that's the millimeter wave. Now it's not active until the phone connects to it. And I was getting most of the millimeter wave radiation from the phone itself. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's really, it's kind of interesting technology that way. It's completely different than, than, uh, the 4G and the 3G, the ultra wideband is yeah. it's, and so we can't really measure it the same way or have the same assumptions about, 
uh, what it's doing or even how bad it is. Um, you know, I, you know, and there's some, there's some, uh, you know, personally, I, I, I know that 4G has been terrible for people's health. And, uh, and, and one of the things that I, that I did when I was, when I was out testing this is I was like, you know, how long is it going to take me to upload this video or download this song with 4G? And, you know, it'd take like, you know, a minute or two minutes to, to do something. Whereas when I connected to 5G on my, on my phone, it took like five seconds. So wow. is it, is it better to have a long exposure with 4G frequencies or sw like switch over to 5G, download it for five seconds and then turn it off? You know, these are, these are the kind of questions that we're going to start needing to ask ourselves with 5G. Is it all bad? I don't like any of the technology. I think it, I think it is detrimental to our health. Yeah. But if you're going to be using it, what's worse? 4G for two minutes or 5G for five seconds? And then 5G on demand or 4G 270 degree angle or whatever angle they're using all the time on all the time blasting everyone. So there's also yeah. the on demand part of 5G that Oren Miller has been talking about since I think 2018 was really fascinating to me. If, if just for economical reasons, the telcos want to stop irradiating the population unless they they're asking for it with their phone that would actually be an improvement on the entire electrosmog problem if, yeah. if only like okay let's say you're in a remote area there's no one and the the cell tower turns off imagine what it's going to do to nature it's going to help but yeah yeah it, it should be it should be doing the same with wi-fi routers with sensors with everything should be at least in some sort of very low power idle mode if there's no one that is actively asking for for data for connectivity and i think these improvements will happen maybe just because they want to save cash that's probably just the in, the only incentive is probably that certainly not saving the planet but uh yeah it's an improvement i'm glad to hear that so People that want to look at that uh, millimeter wave uh, range meter, what do you know the name yet? How it's gonna be called? Yeah, it's uh, it's called the FM five. FM five. Okay. Yeah. FM five, and uh, if available, we're gonna have it uh, on the show notes uh, underneath this video on YouTube or. Uh, the same version on my website for the audio version. And regardless of its availability, I'll let you know about it. So if it's a little bit later, it, it, it is it something that you will try to have in stock uh, via your shieldedhealing.com website? Yes, definitely. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. So uh, let's see what we can arrange. Uh, if we can uh, at least uh, send a link out the moment it's available. I know a lot of people have been waiting for it. And I hope that in the future it can be upgraded. I, I like stuff that is upgradable because, again, like in the future, maybe you want to measure 60 to 90 gigahertz, including car radars and things like that, that I've been talking about for a few years. And it's very frustrating because I've just been talking about it and then leaving people hanging like, OK, well, OK, Nick, it's another problem. What? Like I cannot even measure it, so yeah. I'm well, just, car car uh, radars, you can actually uh, because they they emit a little bit of dirty electricity. I've noticed like even with the phone radar that's on here, some of it's light based, but there's um there's also you can you can use the kilohertz uh, radio to measure a lot of the radar because it's emitting that kind of close by, so you can hear it. Uh, if you're on the right frequency with this, okay. and this is like like forty bucks online. This brand is Tech Sun. And, Tech Sun uh, PL three eighty. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, this is a really good tool to have just to measure dirty electricity, dirty energy, your solar inverters, things like that. You can just turn it on and go around your house and just kind of see what what buzzes and what creates some. Sometimes there's whistling sounds. There's all kinds of sounds you can hear from this thing that your electronics are emitting. That's perfect. And uh, before I go, Brian, uh, we're going to just, I guess, invite people to the webinar we're giving on July 1st uh, as a special, this special webinar we're doing for a relaunch of our course, Electro Pollution Fix. Um, we've talked about it, I think, in our last conversation, was it out? It wasn't, wasn't even out yet. So we worked for the better of the last two years and a half now, I think. 
Uh, we did the two beta versions. We worked an entire year on the new version, and now we're relaunching it with a special price and doing a webinar on 5G and the myths around 5G. And I know that uh, you've already touched on some of those in the in this conversation, so I don't think we need to discuss them further. But we're going to talk about why we don't think 5G is the only thing you should fear. All the electro mm -hmm. pollution matters, and uh, all, every EMFs you've mentioned, including light, and I think you went in there and uh, did a very good job of explaining why actually light matters when it comes to, to our health. If we forget it in the EMF discussion, we're really lost, I think. So uh, yeah. July 1st, and the invite's going to be underneath this video also. So I hope that uh, people like the conversation and uh, do tell us about your website, services, and where people can reach you and uh, anything like that. Sure, yeah, shieldedhealing.com. And you guys saw the Instagram page, Instagram slash shieldedhealing. Uh, we're on Facebook as well, facebook.com slash shieldedhealing. And yeah, just follow us. I'm trying to do more Instagram stuff too. I'm not very good at it. And uh, I'd, like, I'd like to do more though, because there's a lot, that, a lot of people that you can reach through there and, and a lot of information that can be, can be shared. Uh, so, but yeah, the course that, that Nick and I developed, it's like the point of us developing it was so that we could really like guide people logically through the process of, okay, where do you start? How do you not waste your money on things that don't work? And how do you get your family members on board? And how do you prioritize all of this stuff? Because there's so much information about EMF and there's so many different directions you can go in ways that you can waste thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah. But, you know, the, the goal of the course is to guide you right through like that whole process and, and, and like where do you see the light at the end of the tunnel with this whole thing? And, you know, we, I, I really think we did a good job uh, doing that. And, and, you know, of course I'm biased, but I, I do believe it's the best course out there and it will be for a long time. Yeah, me too. I mean, yeah, it's, it's been a long, long, long process and it's been uh, refined and refined based on the feedback of hundreds of people that took it at first. So it's also very close to, I think, uh, how people think, what people want, what people expect out of the course, what types of tools do they want to learn from. So I think that the feedback, that's why the feedback has been very good. And now we have, uh, I think with everything that we did and uh, some people purchased the course during the summit in the last six months, I think we have more than 1,500 members now. Uh, so mm -hmm. a lot of people that can, uh, that can also uh, give feedback on the course and whatnot. So uh, it's uh, very, very nice to, uh, to have you on board. We're going to have also EMF Insider that we're launching as you're mm -hmm. listening to this. Stay tuned for the announcement. It's going to be a little bit after this podcast is released. A new community and monthly uh, Q&A slash masterclass. So uh, let's say the continued education part of our course will be in EMF Insider. I'm very excited to launch this with you and to continue educating people and answering their question in a more organized format and community. Uh, from that point on and I think it's going to be a project that's going to be very amazing in the next years I'm very excited for it yeah me too it's it, there's always something new to learn and, and I'm, I'm always learning I know you're always learning from a lot of the experts that are out there and and also from what we do with shielded healing and and what we're seeing out there in in real life like in the trenches of of the the EMF soup that we're all living in <laughs> and uh yeah, the the I think the the Q and A format and people kind of getting the inside scoop is really cool. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. Awesome, perfect. So well, so stay tuned for the upcoming uh, launch of that EMF Insider, the launch of that FM five meter, and then uh, the relaunch of that course. If you're if you're not on the Electro Pollution Fix, you should be and wait for the announcement on my list or Brian's list. Uh, you're going to learn about the rebate that we're giving towards this relaunch. And it's going to be very, very cool uh, to have new people coming in and uh, offer the course at a discounted price. So stay tuned for it. Brian, it's a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for uh, your friendship. And uh, our partnership has been uh, amazing. And I know that people from my community appreciate your work so much. And uh, everyone, if you're looking for a shielded room, you're in the States, or somewhere else and you want to consult, you, I know you also do online stuff, or you want to build consult or anything, shieldedhealing.com. 
that's the place I would go first. Uh, Brian uh, is amazing in itself, but I met a lot of, well, several of his pros that he hired over the years, and I had the chance to uh, hang out with them a couple of days in, in Florida back in, in September of 2021, and these guys are real geeks. They know shielding, <laughs> they know EMF mitigation, and they also have uh, a great heart. I think people you hire are very like-minded. Everyone there is is there to help first, and it shows. So uh, you did a great job, and I know that shielded healing, uh, if, if you decide to put your faith in this company, you're going to be rewarded uh, tenfold. That's, that's really what I perceive of, of, of your work, Brian. So thank, thank you, you for everything you do. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. All right. See you next time. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.